welcome to our noon lunch series. Uh, today we are fortunate to be able to have Dr. Anish from UW Milwaukee here. He's uh, from the Department of Sociology and Global Studies. He has his um, PhD from Rutgers 2001 and he has been, um, I see from, I, I mentioned that we had been in Allahabad together, so starting from Allahabad to Delhi to California uh, through a whole series of permutations and now he is teaching here in Milwaukee, so we're really happy to have him. Um, he's written some very interesting books, his recent book, um, Virtual Migration, the Programming of Globalization, and more interesting is the forthcoming several books that he has in press, uh, World Making, Art, Media, and the Politics of the Global, and I saw one of the um, grants that he had re researching life as property, the ethics of plant ownership which I think may relate to neem plants, right? Yes. Who owns the neem plant? Who owns the neem plant, <laughs> yes. So some interesting work that he's been doing on globalization. Today he's gonna to talk about mutations of citizenship, India and the world. What is the future of citizenship in the global age? So please welcome Dr. Anish. Thanks, Mark. Uh, one of the titles, actually, of the books that's forthcoming is out with a different title. <laughs> Changed by the press. Uh, they thought uh, it'll be more catchy. It's, it's, it's instead of world making, they have named it as uh, uh, Beyond Globalization. So I never thought when we were writing the introduction, but, uh, but that's how it is. So um, this is a new project. I'm kind of uh, starting. Just last year, I started. Uh, have done some research. Actually, one of my research assistants, um, Bob Barton, is here. He has been working on the project with me. Um, and I'll start with very two very small puzzles. Um, they're not that big. Um, they're kind of big, huh? Is the rise of egalitarian <laughs> citizenship connected to a genocidal 20th century? Um, a lot of people have written about this, including Foucault's Biopower, uh, Agamben's you know, Homo Sacher. And the second is puzzle is uh, how do we talk about citizenship, the idea of national citizenship in the global age? And on that front, too, many uh, different kinds of scholarship have emerged. Uh, and so we'll discuss some of that. But I will come to the specifics of, uh, I'll end the talk with what my area, general area of specialization is also technology, information technologies. So um, interesting connections that we think we can make. But I'll be very happy to hear your comments, uh, feedback, uh, because it's still a very new pro uh, project. And uh, we'll be happy to accommodate and incorporate your uh, critique and criticism. So let me start with three paradoxes. Territory, citizenship, and nation state. And once we have discussed that, we are going to discuss how immigrants bear the brunt of these paradoxes. Uh, so these paradoxes are not just academic, abstract paradoxes, but actually they play out in the lives uh, of a lot of people, and immigrants are one of that uh, components. And then think about what kind of, we call it mutation is the wrong word, but uh, there are different lines of flight that emerging uh, in terms of citizenship. And uh, so we'll discuss some of that and see uh, whether those paradoxes and puzzles get resolved uh, in these developments. First, the paradox of territory. Um, some people have talked about how nation state, the fantastic accomplishment of the nation state in modern era is that it takes the idea of kinship family model place-based solidarity of a village, you know, a small village, and turns it into a much larger territorial scale where, actually, let me go back, where you cannot, from the village where everyone knew each other to an imagined community of Benedict, Benedict Anderson where you cannot, it's impossible for you to know uh, because of the territorial scale of, uh, of the territory. So it, what emerges is the kind of solidarity of strangers, which is itself a paradox. Now, it seems it's, uh, it's not, it's, it's just an ordinary development, but it has very serious consequences to what I call the genocidal, the genocidal 20th century. So the emergence of what Foucault has talked about uh, populations is part, I think, it's part of this, uh, this scaling up of the village and turning it into an abstract territory. And it's very deeply connected. And it's another uh, connected component is that when we think of national citizenship, um, 
Of course, it's not kinship based, it's not relational, um, but it is abstract. So the idea of national citizenship is again, is kind of Janus based, it's, it's double coded. On the one side, you have the ascriptive coding, which is very important to bring the nation together. I mean, that's how, that's how patriotism is possible. That's why 9-11 uh, you know, you know, uh, disaster can create a kind of solidarity among Americans. Uh, so that, what, what has been turned into ethno-nationalism in many places, so that coding is very, has been very important, almost fundamental to the rise of the nation state, where the, the state, the purely administrative aspects have been connected with nationhood, with peoplehood of some kind. But then also, you have people like Habermas who talk about constitutional patriotism, where, uh, quite like after Immanuel Kant and Rousseau, people are, it's, people's membership in a nation is voluntary. It's not involuntary, you're not, in, you know, not through the accident of birth, but voluntary, where people are both the addressees and the authors of the law. So these two, and it's, it's double coding is important because this is what how citizenship is administratively governed. That's how it's, uh, it's done. But territoriality and this double coding, this paradox of you know, both ascriptive and voluntary at the same time, creates the impossibility of ethnic cohesion. So now that results in uh, a lot of, and I'll just give you a couple of examples, how national citizenship is double coded in actual cases. Look at the Naturalization Act of 1790 in the US itself. You have been enacted in Congress that any alien, being a free white person, who shall have resided within the limits. So it's, it's equality before the law, equality before, citizen, citizen, uh, uh, before uh, equality of citizenship. But at the same time, it's coded as ethnic citizenship, being white, which of course changes over time. But it has very clear consequences. Um, you know, for example, the Japanese American internment camps in 1942 and 40, it's double coding again because two thirds of the Japanese, 110,000 uh, Japanese, in turn, were citizens, administratively, voluntarily, the achievement side of, uh, side of national citizenship. So this double coding relates with, uh, with this kind of confusion that plays out in the lives of minorities. And the whole idea of the minority emerges as a problem, as an anomaly to be solved. And I think, uh, so the, the territorial scale of nation and the village model of ethnic cohesion together give rise to the uh, uh, populations that don't fall in the in the what Agamon would call the nomos, the dominant nomos of uh, of a country. So they become then the new category, which Agamon talks as Homo Satcher, sacred man, that was you know applicable to individuals earlier. But the entire populations emerge that are neither enemies nor criminals. That is, they are included through exclusion where the law applies by not applying to them. So undocumented immigrants are one of them. Uh, but the Holocaust is related with that. Uh, where, the, for the first time, the idea of getting rid of the population emerges. Because elimination, in, in India we know quite well, uh, Hindu-Muslim conflict, Hindu-Muslim genocide after the partition was part of this. Where the entire population emerges as a problem to be solved as something that shouldn't be there, but somehow is there. Uh, and that's where genocidal temptations occur, uh, where they are neither breaking the law, like a criminal does, neither they are enemies, they're not after certain resources, resources or trying to overpower the country, but they are themselves in their own existence become a problem to be, uh, to be gotten rid of. So now, so mutation number one occurs here. First mutation is human rights, and people have talked about human rights as the same in the same liberal vein as if it's just an extension of citizens' rights. But it's kind of fundamentally different from citizens' rights. Citizenship model of nationhood is based on membership and non-membership. It's exclusive inclusion. That is, you are the either ex either or excluded or included. But human rights do not have either or. Everyone is in included by default, that's the, so it has the liberal humanism built into it, but it's quite not, quite not the same as citizens, citizen rights, it's quite different. 
So then uh, the third paradox of the nation states emerge in which people uh, after John Meyer in sociology have talked a lot about whether the nation state is not, a, not very national after all, which is mostly what they call a cultural diffusion of certain models that all nation state states uh, uh, adopt. So models of development, model of rights, models of science, models of education, models of uh, uh, various forms. The way nation states conjure up life, the, the, the way they arrange life in a nation is not very national. So the paradox is that on the one hand, they have to be national, ethno-nationalism, religion, ethnicity, language, history, um, and racial, and, and a patriotism based on that because it's very hard to be patriotic towards uh, you know, models of science and models of development. So that paradox, and now that in global age, this becomes even more uh, pronounced, uh, as we know. So then, what we see is that um, with immigration, again, with, which are neither the enemy nor the criminal, they bear the brunt of these contradictions. They start emerging one after the other. Uh, you, you know, we have an enormous history uh, in the United States of the changing in the immigration, changes in immigration laws based on um, ethnicity. So you have Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, then you have National Origins Quota of 1924, uh, which uh, halted undesirable immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe itself. Uh, so the racial bias in Europe itself was, within Europe was displayed in those acts uh, in order to, uh, because Southern and Eastern Europe were kind of becoming almost half of the immigration, and eventually they were, um, um, they were changed. And the law that then law changes, because after the Holocaust uh, and the 1965 acts, then starts overturning some of the earlier racial bias and welcoming immigrants from all nations equally, and that's how the demography of the US changes. So what's interesting about these naturalization processes is that you see the wavering between the two models, the, the double coding of nationhood that constantly plays out in every legislation and every bill that's passed. And of course, Arizona, recent one, immigration troubles, who look, you know, people who don't look like Americans. And that also allows, allowed to, um, you know, applies to Indian programmers. Actually, Charles Schumer uh, introduced a bill to a control uh, immigration where Indian programmers could be placed in with any firm in the US. So they came on a visa for, to work on a particular, with a particular firm and then, then, then they moved around without any authorization from uh, the immigration services. So, and then you have low skilled, so these high skilled H-1B visa immigrants are charged a higher fee to control not the high skilled immigration in the US but actually low skilled immigration. That money was particularly um, geared towards controlling low-skill immigration the, along the southern border. So this wavering and these paradoxes continually play out and still today, and not much has changed. But the, then, there are some developments that are emerging. And we, what, that is mutation number two, which is we do see in the last 20 years the rise, enormous rise of dual and multiple citizenships given by not, no one else but the state themselves. And that's, um, so you have, between 2000 and 2004, you have these many countries, many more countries. Actually, since if you go back to 1990, you have an like 55 nations in some form or the other. These dual citizenships and multiple citizenships are not all equal. Uh, but they have been introduced in the last, in the last just 20 years. So this development is, changes quite a few things. The territoriality, the paradox of ter territory that within the container model of nation state, it solves it because now it is ethno-nationalism. Let's not forget the dual and multiple citizenship is still eth eth ethnic and national, you know, based on nationhood of some sort, of peoplehood of some sort. But it breaks down the model of territory. That is, it, is apply it applies to people who are not living in that territory. So it's, it's citizenship at a distance. It begins the citizenship at a distance. Now, let me go to India's model, um, which is I'm trying to study a little more in depth. Uh, in the 19, late 90s, they started uh, 
persons of Indian, Indian origin uh, card scheme. There was a report of the high level committee on Indian diaspora and a very, you can read very ethnic uh, nationalism here. And it says it is so widespread, the Indian diaspora is so widespread that the sun never sets on the Indian diaspora. <laughs> so they turned the tables on the British, you know, uh, where the sun never sat on the British, uh, 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 British Empire. Um, so, and you again keep on saying the refrain of the song, especially so far as the Indian diaspora in North America, Europe, Australia, um, New Zealand, Singapore, and other few countries connected, is the persistent demand and expectation of total, uh, of dual na nationality. And you see the pictures of pride here, you know, the <coughs> famous Indian Nobel you know, Prize winners, etc., have been placed prominently in this report uh, as people who do not, did not live in India, or they moved out of India, but India could be proud of them nonetheless. So you can see it's citizenship at a distance um, to people who are um, abroad, living abroad, Indians living abroad. Um, but if you look at, if we really look at it closely, the idea was not ethnic nationalism at all. The idea was the economic, the markets. That is, the dual citizenship was given in the garb of ethnic nationalism, because that's the model that was available to the nation state. But actually, it was given to bring in more investments from li uh, people living abroad, Indians living. So using that or milking that patriotism of, early, you know, of childhood socialization into money for the nation state in some ways. So the reasons are economics, because the first, if you go back to history of this, this scheme, overseas citizenship, India, first round, only a few countries were allowed, Australia, Canada, Finland, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, United Kingdom, and the US. So people, Indians living in only in these countries. But there was a furor. So then they came out with a second round. They added Israel, New Zealand, Cyprus, Sweden, Switzerland, France, Greece, and Portugal. But then again, there was a hue and cry that people living in other countries, they start saying, what about us? You know, what's the point? What's the criterion for excluding us who are living in uh, other places? So they have extended it pretty much to all over the globe, except people who are really ethnically a little too close for comfort. That is Bangladesh and Pakistan. They will never get India's overseas citizenship of India. They will not be, although they are immediately connected. They are part of India. Before the partition, they were India, Indians, right? So what, and that's an interesting, but this, this dual game of ethnic nationalism and citizenship keeps on playing out, but it breaks down the model of territory uh, and, and kind of gets out of the paradox of territory in some ways. So you can see that why this nationalism is very economic. Uh, and this is a quote from the committee's report itself. India has ambitious plans to increase investments. And recently, um, in the last trip to India, I started interviewing uh, people who are associated with the rising program. I don't know, uh, some, some of you might know that in the last couple of years, they have introduced a new ministry, Ministry of Overseas Indian Affairs which is like the, in the Ministry of Indian Diaspora in some ways. It is very different from the Ministry of External Affairs. Um, I, was, I worked for the Indian government for a long time, so I have a lot of connections, so I started interviewing people there. And I realized that there's a still a, very, a lot of tension between the two ministries. The Ministry of External Affairs wants to handle this matter, because they've had their consulates all over the globe for so, so long. Uh, but the government wants, is trying to create a totally new ministry because they think External Affairs Ministry, which has been, you know, uh, with more with, you know, which has been dealing with diplomacy, etc., are not good actors here. Uh, we want a very different kind of ministry and different relationship with the Indian diaspora. So that ministry, ministry is starting a, a completely new program called India Development Foundation. And India Development Foundation leads to leads us to a different. Um, almost a different paradigm of citizenship in the sense that now the Indian government is floating an agency which is an NGO. The government is an NGO, is becoming an NGO, non-governmental organization. That is, they will be registered in different countries. They're, they're, um, like IDF will be registered in the US under the NGO Act 503C. 
So what's interesting about this, in the, in the, there is a rise which I would call the, sec, the, 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 uh, the third mutation, which is the rise of the NGOs, a different kind of citizenship that's emerging. And what's interesting, about, I was, when I was interviewing the CEO, who's actually a civil servant, um, but somehow he's the first CEO, it, it was his idea, Mr. Gurcharan, very, very intelligent man, and he talks about how IDF is not geared towards abstract citizenship, like abstract devotion to India, abstract patriotism or ima towards imagined community, but imagination has been made much smaller. So that Tamils living in the US should be able to, if they want to open a hospital for, Tamil, uh, for a Tamil village in, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, they should be able to do it. If Andhra people living in the US or in New Zealand or England, they want to introduce, invest something, particularly for their very own community, actually whose members they might even know in person, they can do it. So this idea is turning into, it's kind of spreading like an NGO like a network structure where the state itself is transforming itself in its relationship with Indians living abroad. So this leads us to um, mutation number three, which is what I call virtual citizenship. And the idea of virtual citizenship is that um, it emerges in different forms. One is a state-based form, which is the possibility of different bundles of rights, right? So the Overseas Citizenship of India, for example, gives me um, rights uh, as a US citizen. Now, if I apply for OCI, I will be given certain citizenship rights, certain sets, but not all. It comes, you know, it comes in a bundle. But it's still a liberal conception. I'm a bearer of those rights as an individual. Um, but it doesn't come with, let's say, political rights. I have the economic rights. I can start up a you know, firm in India. I can invest, buy property, uh, um, and do other things. So it comes with economic rights, but not, and travel rights, freedom of movement. But it doesn't come with the political right of holding an office or being able to vote in an election. In some ways, the resident alien card in the US has had this, you know, this, this kind of citizenship. We never recognize that green card holders are citizens of that particular bundle of rights that comes attached with the card. So those, uh, those rights are emerging in many different nation states, and my, my research assistant has been doing work on this, uh, where many different nation states are differently defining these bundles. So as you move out of the territory, what kind, you know, how many different kinds of rights uh, you are the bearer of. <coughs> then, um, then there's a whole NGO-based uh, cause-oriented, you know, particular causes, which it's kind of